Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by Dr. Brian Tallarico of Mountain Medic. Brian is an orthopedic surgeon who loves to go on adventure hunts all over the world. We discuss what can go wrong on backcountry hunts, skills you should learn, what to carry in your medical kit, making your kit accessible, venomous snake bites, customer stories, and much more. The Spartan Forge app utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement, including GPS data, 30 years of weather, academic and state research. The new app includes GPS mapping with incredible aerial imagery, offline dependability, deer prediction, weather updates, journal entries, and much more. You can use the code East Meets West to save 20% off the Spartan Forge app at SpartanForge.ai. And if you're on the fence about it, use a 14-day free trial, put in the code East Meets West, and cancel if you're not a fan, but I think you will like it. Tethered is a company founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting. They have mobile hunting gear options for all types of hunters and continue to push the envelope. Speaking of pushing the envelope, they just dropped their new carbon fiber saddle, the Vader platform at the ATA show and will be available this summer. And if you haven't seen it, the Skeletor climbing sticks are out and just a little bit heavier than the one sticks fold up nicely, but they come with a lot less price point. So I think you'd be happy with those. If you head over to tetherednation.com, check out some of the tethered products and just to learn about saddle hunting. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. Their products are back with a lifetime no fault warranty and an incredible customer experience. Maven just launched the CRS1 and CRS2, the first rifle scopes in the award winning C series collection. Based on the popularity of the C series optics and on requests from customers, they developed a completely new lineup of rifle scopes at a lower cost. You can use the coupon code East Meets West gift for a free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. Kit Folks is the co founder of Under Armour and Big Truck Farms an avid hunter, and just an all-around hardworking American. When I heard that he was building a brewery, I was excited to check it out. Since then, I've become friends with Kip, and Big Trucks Farms has grown into what I would expect. He has been extremely supportive of this podcast and hunting in general, so it went without saying that Big Truck would make a great partner of the show. The Big Truck name and icon promotes the idea of adventure and going past the unknown. They embrace the mindset of hard work in the outdoor lifestyle on the farm with an earn a beer mentality. They support and host archery shoots, donate to veterans, and make damn good beer. Check out Big Truck Farms at btfbeer.com and visit the farmhouse in Parkton, Maryland. On this week's Mountain Buck Monday story of the week, this comes from Will Bowen out of Missouri. On the morning of October 16th in the Mark Twain National Forest, I was fortunate enough to harvest my first public land buck, an Ozark mountain buck. E-scouting and prior experience put me in that particular tree that morning, but it was a cold front and a good amount of luck that pushed this deer by my stand. The bang and running of a stray squirrel dog in the valley below pushed the deer up to the ridge right to me. Stopping at just shy of 20 yards, I took the shot. A marginal shot suspended the excitement, but some good counseling from family and a professional blood tracker made recovery possible. I was able to return several hours later with my father-in-law and brother-in-law, and after a bit of luck on a tricky recovery, I was able to put my hands on my very first Missouri mountain buck. That's an awesome story, Will, and you've written into me a few times, and you ended up shooting another awesome buck there in November. 
Um, I, I'm excited for you and, and it looks like you've been putting in a lot of time to learning this. So you can go check out that photo over on Instagram at East meets West hunt or on Facebook at East meets West outdoors. Go ahead and send in your mountain buck Monday submission to Bo at East meets West hunt.com. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, Something I don't think I've actually mentioned it on the podcast at all yet, but I had I took a course from Cody Rich. If you're into Western hunting, you've definitely heard of the Rich Outdoors podcast. And Cody had come out with something he calls the Rich Life Academy, and it's basically teaching you how to make time and money on the side. It's either from a side hustle or just becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and basically not the same of just how to start a business, but how to do it where you're making time and money at the same time. So I, I signed up for the course. Um, I paid for it and went to, uh, went to it and it was a live course as he started, it was the first time doing it. And it was a very, it was a very valuable course for anybody that's interested in, and wanting to learn how to make money on the side for hunting or interested in entrepreneurship. If you don't like the job that you have, I'd really suggest checking out Cody's course. He just released uh, the actual online version that you can complete on your own time where I was doing it on a scheduled time meeting with him. It's I'm, I'm telling you what, if you don't, if you don't get your money back and value out of that course, then I, I don't know what to tell you. It's I, I'm a big believer in investing in knowledge, and I think that it'd be worth it if that's something that you're interested in. So I was talking to Cody and about it and how I was I thought it was really valuable, especially with what I do here with the podcast and and some of my future plans. And he was and he was like, how about I give you a code uh, for the listeners of the podcast if anybody's interested. So if you do want to check it out, you can save $50 on the course by using the code East Meets West. Um, if you're looking for a change in direction in your life or really just trying to look for some sort of a side hustle and looking for ideas on what to do or where to start, I would highly recommend checking that out. His information is at therichoutdoors.net. You can find all the the information on that there. Uh, in other news, I I'm fine. I'd, I'd mentioned it um, a few times on this show, but I'm finally going forward with it and getting it planned. But going to do the scouting workshop, and I haven't. I have an idea of what what that's going to look like. I've been going back and forth on whether I want to make it a one-day course or a two-day course. I'm looking at one day right now, but I'm still open for suggestions. So anything I say here, please shoot me an email at bo at eastmeetswesthunt.com and let me know if you're interested and what some feedback and stuff on it. But so what I'm looking at is I'm, I'm still working on the pricing and everything. But what I'm figuring is since this is my first time doing a workshop, I'm going to offer the course at a much, um, at a lower cost than I, I typically would, which I'll probably, well, I'm definitely going to lose money on it, but I just want to try it out, get feedback from people, get the bugs worked out. So I'm looking at $125 for a one day course and a two day course. If, if I was going to go that route being about $250, and so this would include a classroom session with uh, people like myself. Um, I was talking to Jake Bush about it, and he's going to come out and be a part of it. Haven't talked to Johnny Stewart yet, but I'm sure I could get him involved in it, um, as well as some some other people. Um, Taylor from Tethered is going to come in and do some saddle hunting part of it and teach you how to teach you how to saddle hunt let you go over the gear check that out um possibly chad from exodus trail cameras come in talking a little bit about trail cameras and some of the strategy there um bill from spartan forge going over some of the mapping and deer prediction stuff but um and then the what i think the most value is going to be out of this is the in the field scouting so we're going to go out in the field take the knowledge that we learned in the classroom portion of it and apply it in 
the the mountains here in Pennsylvania and go through it and try to find buck beds and try to find sign and show you what we talk about and how to do that for yourself. So I think this course could be really cool or this, this workshop here. Um, it's going to include, I mean, so when I said the cost of the course, you're going to get, um, I can promise you you're going to get that back in value um, just from some of the free stuff. going to give give away a free membership um, to everyone that comes in for Spartan Forge, um, discount on exodus cameras, uh, dis, a major discount on Tethered, and a bunch of other things. Again, I haven't worked out all the details yet. This is just me brainstorming and wanting to involve you guys to give feedback and see what your thoughts were. But that would take place in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. I have uh, a lodge that's um, Kit Folks's property that he's allowing me to, to use for this. And, um, and uh, so there'll be a lodge and, and property to do the scouting on. It's, it's going to be pretty legit. I think it, I think it'd be really valuable. I'm only going to take a limited number of uh, people because I want it to be, extremely valuable and one-on-one -on -one for a lot of these things and being able to have a smaller group setting. So that's my thought on it. So if you're interested, uh, send me over an email. There were some people that reached out over the last couple of times I brought it up and I have all your names written down. Um, so to be contacted, uh, I, I, I'll probably release this first through my email list. So if you go on eastmeetswesthunt.com and either sign up there or just shoot me an email, like I said, that'll, that'll get you notified first on when this comes out. So again, love to hear some feedback. The weekend that I'm going to do it is the weekend of April 9th and 10th. Uh, that's what I'm looking at for this. So uh, that, that should be before spring green up, snow will be gone, be perfect time to get in the field scouting and doing some fun stuff. So let me know if you are interested in this at all and, uh, we can go from there on this week's episode. As I said, I have Dr. Brian Tallarico and I'm really excited uh, about this one. It's not sexy to talk about, uh, <laughs> first aid or anything like that, but I think it's super important and the preparedness side of it. And, you know, my goal with this podcast is to give you a better hunting experience and help you, uh, have a hunting experience, whether you're going on venture hunts out West, or you're hunting white tails, whatever that might be. I think there's a lot of information in this, uh, episode here. So please again, give me some feedback and, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this episode and we will talk to you next week. All right, we're live. Dr. Brian Tallarico, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Bo. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to link up with you and talk. I've heard a, heard a lot about you through a mutual friend, Matt Comment, and uh, no yeah. Comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt's a good guy and he hasn't, he hasn't steered me in any wrong direction up to this point on uh, he's, he's linked me up with some, some great people like yourself to, to get the talk and, and become friends with. So, um, I'm excited. Yeah, it's good stuff. He's uh he's definitely a good, uh, connector for sure. <laughs> yeah. So Brian, why don't you, uh, start by telling a little bit about your, your background, um, uh, professionally kind of growing up and then uh, also in, into hunting right so uh you know i found out about this opportunity uh through matt i was pretty excited because uh i was born and raised in pennsylvania you know, western pa south of pittsburgh and people think you know i must have lived in the city growing up but you know back then we thought we were so far from the city and yet we were probably 20 to 30 minutes drive. But as a kid, you think it might as well be, you know, across the country. But I grew up in a pretty rural area, a lot of farms and, uh, you know, small properties and stuff. So my neighbors were scattered. And uh, I had the good fortune of being able to hunt and fish, you know, right basically in my backyard. So uh, that was pretty formative. Uh, my dad and my brother were hunters, uh, just basically deer hunters, uh, not as passionate about it as you or I or some of our friends, but it definitely helped uh, light that spark, so to speak, when I was very young. Um, you know, Pennsylvania, as you know, you have to be 12 years old to hunt. Uh, and it used to kill me that I wasn't able to go out with them when I was 9, 10, 11 years old because I was already starting to read everything I could get my hands on about uh, hunting. And I would sneak into the library at the grade school and grab the sports of field and the Pennsylvania game news and 
borrow them, so to speak, for an mm-hmm. extended period of time. <laughs> <laughs> Until one day the librarian figured out who it was and she asked me politely if I would bring back all the hunting and fishing magazines. <laughs> so I did. I had a nice little collection going when I brought them back. And so, I mean, I tell that story a lot because that really was kind of how I got into the outdoors hunting in particular. Um, so I ended up going to college not far uh, from where I grew up and then uh, knew I wanted to go into medicine, go, into med- go to medical school. So I ended up getting into medical school in the Chicago area school there. And uh, knew I wanted to become a surgeon. So I became an orthopedic surgeon and did my residency in Columbus, Ohio, at uh, Ohio University. Not the Ohio State University, but Ohio University, which is based out of uh, Athens, which is southeast, which is awesome deer country, by the way. And I wish I wasn't so busy back then. I could have enjoyed some of that uh, hunting in southeastern Ohio. So fast forward, um, I knew I had to figure out a way to pay for uh, medical school. Um, so I ended up going to the United States Navy. Um, they actually, it was a scholarship program where they pay for medical school and in return after you're done with residency, you owe active duty, um, four years, uh, when I did it, then they changed it to eight years then they changed it back to four. But, uh, I came from a military family my dad was in the army. My brother was in the Navy and uh, I had some great uncles that were in the Navy in World War II, and so it was pretty natural for me to do that. That was the uh, best decision I ever made in my life. It was an uh, awesome experience, um, and it was so worth it to me to uh, do the four years of active duty. It was a no-brainer. And uh, those four years, uh, that was the first four years of me being an, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, first four years of practice, and uh, it was pretty special. I was stationed in uh, the northwest, the uh, basically up by Seattle, Bremerton, Washington. And uh, there I became trained in, uh, you know, field, uh, you know, combat medicine, basically. Yeah. And so uh, that that becomes important uh, down the road uh, as we start to talk about um, our topic today, which is basically backcountry first aid and um, taking care of yourself in the wilderness uh, when there's no medical care around. So I, I got out in the Navy in uh, 2006. And again, good fortune to uh, find my dream practice, which was in Western Wyoming, south of Jackson Hole, which is God's country if anybody uh, has been there. And I was there for 11 great years, and uh, I got to check the box as a relatively young man to live in the Rocky Mountains, which is something I dreamt about ever since I was borrowing those uh, magazines from the library and at the grade school about hunting elk and mule deer in Colorado and Wyoming and Montana. Yeah, that's. So that was, uh, I think that's every every kid, especially your hunters, you know, dream is to to get to do that. That's for sure. Absolutely, and uh, so it was really cool to live that dream. And uh, not everything lasts forever. Um, you know, again, it was eleven years. Raised my family there. My son was. He's the only one that can say he's a true uh, Wyoming native. He was born in the hospital in Jackson Hole, so he's twelve years old now, and he likes to remind us he's the only one that was ever born in. Uh, in Wyoming and the rest of us don't count. <laughs> so, um, in there I got to, uh, got to do a lot of Western hunting and, um, most of it was basically, uh, public land and self-guided or going with friends that knew the area better than I, because they'd lived there grown up there. And so I was fortunate to be able to take some good mule deer and elk and some antelope when I drew the tags and hunted, uh, neighboring States like Idaho and then Montana a couple times, and uh, even Utah. So not that I'm an expert by any means, but I became pretty comfortable with uh, hunting in the backcountry, um, sometimes on horseback, sometimes just on foot. Excuse me. And uh, then I started going on some uh, guided and outfitted hunts uh, in other parts of North America, like Canada, and even going up to Alaska a few times for um, caribou and moose and brown bear and Sheep. So I started really getting into the the big stuff. I would say probably 2000 and well, right around 2006, whenever I got out of the Navy. And uh, I felt that hunters in general were woefully un- underprepared when it came to first aid kits or medical kits. And as a surgeon, especially military surgeon, I started carrying my own first aid kit. Um, you know, a custom one on every hunt. And even whenever I was in the Navy, I went on a couple uh, hunts, one in Montana and, 
And uh, so I always had a medical kit with me. It was just a natural thing. I just thought that everybody sh- did and everybody should come to find out that very few people did. Yeah. And uh, when I started going on these pretty serious hunts, you know, in the middle of the wilderness in Alaska or Canada, it was it actually hit home that if I didn't have one, then if something happened to me or my guide, we were screwed. So I would give one of those kits to the the guide, the sheep guide or whatever. And uh, one of them finally said a few years ago, he said, you need to start making these things. You need to like start a company to make them. You need to make them available to hunters and guides and outfitters. And, and that's kind of what I did about three or four years ago. I started Mountain Medic. And uh, it's basically a little, little side job. It's a lot of work, but uh, I like to think that I have – um, something available for every type of hunter, whether you're east or west or deer hunter or sheep hunter or even international hunter like Africa, dangerous game, things like that. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of how we got this podcast together is basically talk about backcountry first aid and the right kind of medical kits. Yeah, you you know, it's, it is funny because, uh, you know, being – being a hunter myself and getting to go to some more places now and seeing that I've realized that, uh, first aid in general, first aid kits, train, uh, training kits, all that stuff is overlooked a lot of times, uh, by people. And by, by trade, what I do, Brian, is that, uh, I'm a health and safety professional when I'm in manufacturing. So like I spent a lot of time with (laughs) preparing and planning and doing these types of things for manufacturing. And I've just taken that into hunting and kind of rolled that over. And, you know, whether I'm putting together plans for these Western hunts on, you know, if it's even down to like hunt plans for figuring out what areas I'm going to go to backup spots, this and that, then I always have my, my, um, my list of uh, emergency places to go to, you know, medical places, hospitals, anything, um, gas stations, grocery stores, all this stuff and lists and addresses, phone numbers, stuff that I keep inside my first aid kit. I keep in my truck and I, I'm always, I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to plan for contingencies and, and things that could be going wrong. And, and I've realized that that's not necessarily the mindset across the board. And I think a lot of it comes down to just the education standpoint and not understanding right. what you know what can go wrong and what what's actually you know uh possible and it's it comes the reason why i was interested in talking to you specifically is it's different coming from someone that might just be a doctor versus someone that's a doctor has that background and also has done these hunts and lived these right. hunts and and has a lot of friends that have done these things and and uh i i think i i think that um that that's just something that's not talked about enough i guess it's not as sexy to talk about that uh, it's not so it's, that uh, makes sense <laughs> you're absolutely right and you know kudos to you both for uh, actually having the foresight and the wherewithal to have a plan and have uh you know basically an action plan in place if something happens so and just to say it from the get-go i mean as you know the reason why we're talking today isn't an advertisement it's you know if yeah. people want if people are interested in my kits great get a hold of me if you're not it really doesn't matter to me the reason why i started this company was to just have it available to other hunters and outfitters and guides. Um, and whenever I give these instructional talks, I did one at uh, wild sheep foundation a couple of weeks ago. Like my first, the first thing I say is if you want one of my kits, great. If you don't, I really don't, it doesn't bother me. Like it, you're not wasting my time. I'm here to educate you. And I, I gave an uh, hour and long, I guess a little bit longer than an hour instructional thing on backcountry first aid. Mm-hmm. So first and foremost, it, just we'll get it out of the way. Just have a medical kit. If it's mine, great. If it's not, I really don't care. Um, but I think every hunter, every outdoorsman needs to carry one. And the reason is hope is not a plan. That's kind of my, my little catchphrase for, for my uh, website and everything. Because if you hope something's not going to happen, then you're probably going to be okay 90% of the time. But as you know, even relatively young guy, I mean, not, everything doesn't go the way it's supposed to go every time, especially when you're dealing with a handful of things, whether it's conditions, um, you know, hypothermia and things like that, they're always in danger when you're hunting and in bad conditions. You just went ice fishing yesterday, you know, things can go south, you know, somebody falls in through the ice. I mean, it happens every year. Yep. And uh, you're talking about horses. If you're out west, most, of the, you know, a lot of the hunts are done on horseback. That's a very large, dangerous animal. And I don't care who you are and what kind of good cowboy you are. If you're around horses long enough, you will get hurt. And that's, uh, that's orthopedic fact. 
<laughs> I took care of people from, you know, age four to age, you know, 90 that got hurt on horses when I lived and practiced in Wyoming. And then you're talking about um, dangerous animals sometimes, whether you're hunting them or not. If you're hunting out west, there's a pretty good chance uh, you might be in grizzly bear country. And then you're talking about um, weapons. You're talking about firearms and knives. And things happen. And we don't like to talk about it or think about it, but we but we all read uh, we all read the magazine articles and we hear about these horrible things that happen every year in the backcountry uh, in North America. Mm-hmm. So having being aware of all those things and those possibilities, I think, give people a, a, an opportunity to be prepared. And are you supposed to take you know a huge one of those backpack uh, you know army medic? kits up on the mountain when you're doing a backpack hunt and you want to keep your gear down to 40, 45 pounds. And of course not, but you can still carry something. And I think that, uh, you're really overlooking uh, one of the most important things in your kit. If you, if you just sweep it to the side and say, well, I'll be fine. I know how to control bleeding. I know how to, you know, take care of myself. I'm going with a buddy who, you know, he took a first aid course and that, that doesn't count. Yeah. I think you really, you really, we have no problem spending $3,000 on a pair of binoculars or $10,000 on a custom rifle. And then um, when you talk about, when I ask, do you carry a medical kit? No, I don't. So that, that doesn't make sense to me. And I know I'm biased as a, as a surgeon, but I, I think every, like we said before, every hunter that goes out in the field needs to carry something. Now, if you're hunting in your backyard for whitetail and you're just walking around, you know, still hunting, then that's one thing. But um, where I know we're talking a lot about Western hunts today and but again if the type of deer hunting you do Bo you know you're in the you're in the wilderness yeah it's different than what I do here on my property I just walk out my back door and climb a tree stand so yeah no I was just I was just gonna say yeah definitely can be applied to a lot of the the Appalachian Mountain region or even if you're traveling to hunt where you don't have like even traveling to hunt whitetails in a midwestern state but you don't have the luxury of your home being close or you know right. unfamiliar type area and and as you know as you kind of had alluded to there you know the idea of a first aid kit isn't to fully heal you of anything it's more of just getting you to a, a better place and getting you out right so you basically want to be able to save your hunt uh, or save your life and so there's there's the two options as far as the type of kit you're going to carry um things can go awry and um you just have to be prepared for it and i, I came up with a whenever i did that talk at sheep show I, I was thinking about it i was going through my slideshow on the airplane and i thought about it and so whenever i started uh, my talk i said show of hands how many people have a custom rifle and, you know, about 12 people raised their hands. And I said, well, how many of you guys and gals are trained military snipers? And they all put their hands down. And I said, well, you guys all have these expensive, fancy rifles. Are you comfortable shooting them? And everybody nodded their head. And would anybody take a, a course, like a long-range shooting course? And I would say 10 of the 12 people raised their hands. I said, well, that's the same thing with the medical kit. Like uh, part of the problem that I run into and people say, well, I don't want to carry a kit because I don't know how to use them. And they look at the, my kits and I, I don't know how to use that stuff. Well, you're also not a trained military sniper either. Most of the time, I mean, there's some, obviously we have a look, we know a lot of hunters that are uh, military trained and they can outshoot just about anybody. But the average Joe who buys a, you know, a custom long range rifle is not a trained military sniper. Would yeah. you agree? Right. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> so if you're willing to spend that kind of money on a rifle and then go and learn how to use it, whether it's a formal training a weekend course or just going out to the bench rest every weekend and developing the loads and, and everything, then why wouldn't you be willing to do the same thing with you know, a $300 medical kit? Like, Then you just need to learn how to use it, right? You just need to either learn from somebody like me or online or take a first aid course. or So that was the analogy I... I used uh, this um, this past uh, show, and I think it really is an important one to hammer home. I said, "Well, we all we're all gear junkies now. You know, it's 2022. No matter what type of hunting you do, and uh, it's just replete with gear. Right? Where it keeps getting better and better. The technology is getting better and better. And everybody's willing to learn how to use things like you know Onyx maps and and uh, uh, the Kestrels and the range find. You know what I mean? So we're all willing to do that, but yet." 
people will say, well, I'm not interested in, in carrying something extra. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I don't know how to use that. I don't think that holds water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that, and so would you, would you think, um, as far as like the type of training, um, that someone should do for it, like what, what, I guess, what are you recommending for people that are going on hunts? Like what type of training or would you recommend that they go to or learn about? Like, what are some of the, the, yeah. What, what would you recommend from that standpoint? Yeah, that's, uh, I looked into that, uh, when I started this, uh, company, yeah, and I, I think I put the link on the website. Um, but the American Red Cross has uh, their good. Um, there's a good website there. You can look up basic uh, first aid courses, and then you can go all the way up to advanced uh, wilderness, uh, like first responder courses. Now, not everybody's going to do that, but if some of our listeners here today are uh, EMTs or medics, then they have basic training. I think they'll be fine, but those folks, the first responder types that have the ability to even be further certified, um, such as advanced wilderness, first responder training and all like that. I'm not saying that's for everybody, mm -hmm. but at the very least, like our listeners should take a, a basic first aid CPR course. Yeah. So there's two things that are going to, that are going to result in mortality, morbidity on the mountain. And is it safe to say, we'll just talk more about mountain hunting than we are, uh, yeah. hunting, hunting grandma's farm. Yep. you know, for whitetail and a tree stand. We can also talk about injuries that occur there because we know that it can. Um, then I would absolutely uh, take a basic first aid or CPR class because the two things that are going to get you are going to be uh, cardiovascular events. Maybe not a 29-year-old healthy buck like yourself, but maybe your dad, your grandfather, uh, somebody's uncle who's on their first deer, a mule deer hunt or elk hunt in Colorado. You got altitude, you got you know vertical and that's a bad mixture for somebody that may have some underlying cardiovascular disease. So if they have a heart attack at, you know, nine or 10,000 feet and you got in there over a course of a day or two, uh, you, you have a problem. Yeah. And yeah, you can call life flight. You can hit your in reach, things like that. But you have that, that golden hour, so to speak, where you can basically save their life. So, and then trauma would be, um, blood loss. So we'll break it down into cardiovascular events that are pretty serious and then um, trauma, traumatic wounds, whether it's from a Havilon knife, which Havilon knives have given me a lot of business over the last 10 or 15 years <laughs> as an orthopedic surgeon, and then, um, God forbid, uh, gunshot wounds, and then antler tines. Believe it or not, I know of two or three people that have been injured uh, trying to skin or cape out or quarter an elk or deer. And then, you know, the animal slides, you slide, you trip and fall, it's getting dark. You're trying to get the animal taken care of. And then an antler tine goes into the thigh or into the arm or armpit or even chest or abdomen. So it, it can't happen. It's rare. It's a freak accident. But I, like I said, I know two or three people that it's happened to. One is actually a customer of mine, a customer of mine that happened to uh, in Arizona with an elk. Jeez. So, um, you have to be prepared for those things. Broadheads. Think broadheads. Geez, I forgot like the major. Yeah, I'm going with the blades. Um, broadheads are scary, scary sharp, always have been. And uh, and we all have seen the pictures of the broadhead sticking through the thigh, coming out the other end. And, um, yeah, scary stuff. Again, very rare. You look at the man hours in the field for hunters, and then it's, you know, probably just as good a chance to get struck by lightning in the field as to have that happen. But there's still a chance. Yeah. And is it, what else, what else would you think? Is there any, some of the most common, um, or serious injuries that can occur? So you're talking about those two from the, the majors or any other ones that you can think of, or those are the main ones you focus on? Those are the two that I, uh, that I focus on the most in my talks, um, my instructional lectures and things like that. But the little things that, um, if it's a, if it's a life threatening injury or illness, then you, you hit, you call the cavalry, right? You hit the, the in reach button or your yeah. sat phone or your cell phone if you have service. But the things that um, can keep you on the mountain that are pretty serious, um, things as simple as uh, stuff in your eye, like I debris in your eye, you can't glass, you can't, you can't see through your scope, you can't see through your peep sight. So to get something in your eye, um, I mean, that sounds silly, but there's little, there's things you can carry to, to wash that out so you can keep hunting sprains and strains, you roll your ankle, you trip and fall, hit your elbow or your, you know, fall in an outstretched hand, 
hiking. I mean, sprains and strains, that's not life threatening, but it certainly make your, your seven days or five day trip pretty miserable. Are you going to pack you know, stuff to take care of that? And you know, there's small things you can that are lightweight, but you don't have to put like a whole splint kit in your backpack. But, um, yeah. well, and well, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no. like what you were saying there, like, you know, the, there's the life saving events, but those ones that saving your hunt, I mean, think about, you know, all of us here, most of us here that are talking, you know, you're using your vacation and everything to go on these hunts right. that might be seven or 10 days or five days, whatever it is. And just being able to have stuff just to be able to save that, save the rest of your hunt, you know, even if it's not life threatening, not looking at worst case scenario, but being able to save your hunt, like that's such a, that's so important. I know to me personally, after having, um, with being in Colorado, you know, you're talking about, you know, with me being young and relatively healthy, but I still ended up being in the hospital from altitude, um, right. sickness there. And, and, you know, that basically ruined, uh, most of my hunt, well, all of my hunt for mule deer, I ended up being right. able to find elk at lower elevations, but it was, uh, it was, it was a difficult <laughs> pill to swallow. Pretty sobering, but, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Pretty sobering. When you post hunting photos on Instagram, they get censored. When you post on Go Wild, you get virtual fist bumps from fellow hunters. When you buy gear on Amazon, you gas up a billionaire spaceship. When you buy gear on Go Wild, we donate to a camp that teaches kids to hunt, fish, and shoot. See the difference? Go Wild is a free social community built by hunters for hunters. Join today at DownloadGoWild.com, and I'll give you 10 bucks just for setting up your account. And you'll keep unlocking Go Wild rewards as you share content, because guess what? We like hunting pictures. Join at DownloadGoWild.com or in the App Store. There's not really anything you can carry in a medical kit other than um, you know prescription medications, which, which is also another, there's a plug, also another service that I do for hunters is a concierge medicine for travel. Um, but again, not... Uh, laboring the point if you have a trip coming up and it's seven ten days and it's your hard-earned vacation you spend a lot of money in doing it then i think it really behooves you to be prepared and if it needs medications then if you don't use my company then talk to your primary care provider see if they can understand what you're doing unfortunately i think we all know listening that they don't always get what you're talking about why would they give you these antibiotics if you don't have an infection why would they give you this altitude medication if you don't have altitude sickness. So there's a little bit of a block there unless you're fortunate enough, enough to have a doctor that also is an outdoorsman or a hunter then they kind of they can see why it's important to have those things in your in your kit when you go on these expensive trips to faraway places and taking all your valuable vacation time. So um the preparation is key. I, I, we we exercise, we try to get in shape, we shoot and yet Again, this little thing that we're talking about today is overlooked by, I would say, 90% of, of everyone listening, um, and at least 90% of the people I run into um, at the shows and things like that. I think it's getting better even in the last couple of years because I'm more in tune with it, more involved, and um, I'm on the other side now. You're just being, a, I guess, a vendor, so to speak. So it, I think it is getting a little better that people are finally coming around saying, you know, spend all this money on a once in a lifetime sheep hunt or Alaskan moose hunt or even a, a yearly elk hunt with dad and brother and uncle and things like that, then uh, I think somebody in that somebody in that group needs to have the medical kit. Yeah. And and um so w- one of the things I know that it's it probably you know varies depending on what type of hunt you're and where you're going to. But how how should you know what to carry um, in your medical kit? And I know like you know you sell these items and stuff, but like breaking it down on like some of the important tools to have in there, and then how you kind of figure out what's the right right stuff for your hunt, whether it's a backpack hunt or something that maybe you're doing a, a drop off that you can carry a little bit more gear and you have a base right. camp, or say you're driving out west and you're hunting from a truck camp. You know what what you should be carrying while you're going back in, and versus what you should have at your home base. Kind of, I think it's a that's a great question, Bo. Um, and that's probably like the question everybody has on their mind that's going to be listening to the podcast. Like, how do I know what to carry? Well, there's plenty of websites and articles out there uh, in the hunting magazines and the and the uh, hunting websites that experts, quote unquote, and sometimes real experts, sometimes uh, not. That'll say, uh, you know, this is what I carry in my medical kit. And I wrote an article similar to that um, a couple of years ago. But to for nuts and bolts, if you're going to be backpacking or you're going to be carrying everything on your back, don't carry anything more than a pound. Whatever it is, 
up to a pound, I think is reasonable. You get beyond a pound, then you're and sometimes you're going to just leave it back at base camp or in your truck, and it's not going to do any good there. So if it's a backpack hunt, I would say I uh, keep it to a pound or less, and I would have things like we talked about to save your hunt, things to keep you on the mountain, whether it's um, dressings, uh, laceration care, um, wound care. Uh, you don't even have to carry a tourniquet if it's a backpack hunt. If you have a belt, then that could be your tourniquet in an emergency. Uh, when I developed uh, my ultralight kit for backpack, I actually used uh, a very well-known uh, Alaskan outfitter that does some uh, a lot of sheep hunts and grizzly and brown hunts and moose hunts, and he and I developed it together, and we went through it piece by piece, and he pointed and said, throw that out, and he said, leave that in, and he's the one that said, if it's over a pound, my guides won't carry it, because he wanted them for his guides, mm-hmm. because you know the guide has to kind of be in charge if this shit hits the fan, so to speak, and a client gets hurt. Sometimes the guide get hurts gets hurt too, um, and I would say in little things that you think that you might need um, if you're prone to certain things, whether it's uh, intestinal illness and basically and uh, some over the counter medications and things like that, you can put in there. But the big things are, I think, uh, wound care and sprain and strain kind of thing. Like if you sprain your ankle, you got to have something in to wrap your ankle up, even if you have hunting boots on. And same thing with a wrist or a finger, um, just for comfort. You're not going to die from it, but you want it to be stabilized until you get out of the, the back country. Um, I think for the bigger stuff, the bigger trips, uh, if you do these Western hunts with relatives and there's a group of you that go every year and you have a wall tent that you know Uncle Sid likes to set up and he's the camp cook and they have a nice wood-burning stove and a, a sort of a, a nice setup in the same area of the national forest you go every year then by all means you, you could have a bigger kit and you could have it all the way to having even an epi pen in there or um, splinting material for somebody if they you know broke their leg or broke their arm on the side of the mountain uh, more medications and you can get into the more of the i don't want to say life-saving role but you know, stabilization role until emergency help arrives um that can be as big as, you know, three, four, five pounds because you might have horses, you might go in on horseback, or you might get uh, dropped off, you know, from by an outfit or just a drop camp. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And yeah, and then even like like you were saying with, with that as far as the base camp type stuff, and I mean, and that's, I'm sure it apply to like even just keeping that in your vehicle um, from that standpoint as well. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, the vehicle one, I think, is really close to like a base camp one. Um, one thing I do want to say is just be careful about, I call it um, pirating your your medical kit. So if you have one kit, you say, well, I'll take a handful of stuff in a Ziploc bag out of my truck kit whenever I go up the mountain for the day or the weekend. I think uh, invariably what happens is you forget, and then when you really need something, it's in your backpack that's back in your basement whenever you're on the road and you, you come across a bad, bad traffic accident or something like that. So, um, it's not wrong to have more than one medical kit. I mean, a lot of people say, well, it'd be nice to just have one general kit and then I can carry it up the mountain. I can leave it in my truck. I can have it at home. That's all well and good, but I think, uh, purpose built medical kits are, are, are a good idea. I'm not saying you should have five or six for you know every little application, but if you have one for your truck or your home, I would just try to avoid, uh, taking from it and making a mini kit to take up the mountain or, or go on your hunts. Um, that, that's a, that's a really good point. And I, I'll even, uh, give an example of, I, I've learned this more, more so when I have like, I have like toolkits in my truck, like for anything that would happen while I'm on a trip or even just little things as far as my ratchet set for my cap, making sure that comes loose on bumpy roads, just little things I have in there. Well, I, I've been taking that for my household <laughs> kit and applying that yep. and then I'll be somewhere and realize I can't find this because it's here and right. there's where's the 12 millimeter. Yes, exactly. And it's because I already put it in this kit. I don't remember where it's at or, or you know what I mean? So that, that can be exactly. applied uh, across the board. So I can, I can definitely relate to that. And, and, uh, I know I can make some improvements on my, my truck medical kit because I've done exactly what you said there. And that's why I kind of laughed when you, you started talking about it because I'm, I'm guilty, guilty of that myself. Right. And I, I was too once or twice. Um, I did the same thing and, um, and I, I will never do it again because I, I did need something in an emergency and I, I didn't have it because I had already taken it out of that particular kit in the vehicle. Um, 
so it's again not instead of going down the list and saying okay i put an ace wrap and an abd which is a, a big pad for a bad wound and um you know an eye irrigant and um surgical skin glue and things like that it's i think uh, everybody knows it's pretty basic first aid stuff if you have a bad cut then it needs to be clean and you need to dress it and apply compression and you know there's hemostatic powders and agents out there that are over the counter you can buy anywhere but some stuff um you can't get and the prescription grade um dressings and things are are something that that i use obviously every day and uh in the military and in the operating room things like that so those things i also carry in my own medical kits and and provide in the kits that I, that I build. And I think it's, uh, don't take stuff that you don't know how to use unless you're willing to learn. Um, if you have, if you buy a kit over the, you know, again, from sports warehouse or online and it's not mine, I really don't care again, keep saying that, but learn how to use it, open it up, take everything out. And if you don't know what each and everything is and what, what its application is, either learn how to use it, ask somebody, look it up or just leave it out. Because a stressful situation, time is of the essence, and you need to know what you're doing, and you need to be, you need to calm down. So another thing, we there was a, a trauma surgeon in the, in the lecture a couple of weeks ago. He was really good. He didn't say anything till like the last five minutes, and uh, we we came up upon the topic of like when something happens, like the first couple of minutes, the most important stuff. So it's basically calm the f down. Like everybody, calm down. The patient, you. So if somebody gets hurt, somebody's having a heart attack or somebody has, you know, bones sticking out of the skin or cuts themselves with a knife while you're skinning elk, the most important thing is to calm down. Don't panic because if you panic, the patient's going to panic and nobody's going to do well. So I, I guess that's a take home point. If, you know, if we're going to talk for an hour today and your listeners, and hopefully they take home a couple salient points. I think number one is when the shit hit really hits the fan, you need to calm down. Like you got to really avoid panic if you can. And I think to help with that, if you know how to use the medical kit and you know what's in it, I think that's going to go hand in glove with the panic situation. I think if you buy a fancy kit and you've never looked at it and you're hunting and your buddy gets hurt really bad and you dump your pack and you open up the you know, mountain medic or safari medic kit and you empty it on the ground and you don't know what any of it is, you've never seen it before, I think um, it's you're not going to do well. So I just urge, I don't care what kit it is, just learn what's in it, learn how to use it, be comfortable with it. Um, take a class if you can. Like I said, basic first aid class all the way to wilderness medical classes, things like that. I do that. I, I, I uh, actually travel and do those courses for small groups or big groups. And uh, it's very gratifying because the people at the end, these are people with no medical training whatsoever. And we'll spend a half day uh, talking about backcountry first aid and trauma and emergencies. And afterwards, the people are just just blown away with how much more they know than when they started. So that's really gratifying to me to see that. Yeah, and and uh, another point to that is what what would you say about accessibility of these kits, like um, whether it's in your pack or or in your vehicle or base camp, and knowing you know what. Um, I guess where, where it should be at, making sure other people know where it's at. Um, and Great point. I, I Great think point. That that's something that I've been trying to focus on more with all of my gear and kind of prioritizing what I need right now versus stuff that it's okay to dig around and look for. That's not as much of a priority. Hey, Bo, that's another great point. It's almost like you have a script. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, like and there's so much to talk about that I'm probably skipping over some valuable information, but I think, um, the accessibility is, is big. You have to know yourself where, where your kid is and your backpack and whatnot and your buddies or whoever you're hunting with, they need to know where it is. They need to know what color it is. They need to know, is it labeled? Um, my ultralight kits are neon. They're in small, nice, um, water resistant pouches, just little zipper bags from, um, I don't even know what's the name of the company. It doesn't matter. Um, but they're bright orange and, and bright green. They're basically fluorescent. Mm -hmm. And I switched to those uh, a couple of years ago. The first ones I had were a little dark, just basically nondescript gray. Basically looked like an ultralight baggie that you put in your backpack for a, a mountain hunt. I mean, there's 20 companies that make them. The little ultralight ones that you can clip inside your pouch and, or your bag. So I got away from that because I thought, you know, in an event, if you dump your pack out, 
you have this little gray pouch where your camera and batteries and SD cards are. And then you have this other little pouch where you have uh, your, your food, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then you have another little pouch where you have uh, whatever your, your little toolkit for your bow or your, your cleaning kit for your rifle. So I thought, well, that's a bad idea because if somebody's bleeding and now you don't know which one of those pouches is your medical kit. So I switched to the, the neon colors for that. And that way, like if you have one neon bag in your backpack, you know, that's your medical kit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that as far as if I mean, we'll just stick with the backpack name. So if you're on a backpack hunt, I would keep the medical kit either in an outside zipper on your pack in the same spot every trip. And again, make sure your partners know where it is. Or if it's a, just a big uh, bag on a frame and you have your optics and everything on the outside compartments, and that's just the way you do things, then have it at the top of your pack. Whenever you load everything up every day, have it at the top of your pack. So whenever somebody opens, pops those, those uh, buckles, flips open your lid, they look in, they see the bright green, the bright orange medical kit, and they pull it out. They don't have to be reaching in. You know how big these packs can be, right? Yep. Um, last thing you want to do is be, you know, your because let me tell you, let's just use a uh, laceration as a, as a, for instance, um, never cut towards yourself. Right. But isn't it amazing how many quote unquote experts and seasoned hunters you see cutting towards themselves and they're skinning an animal. Right. Yeah. And, uh, if you hit the femoral artery with a knife, you have about 30 to 45 seconds before you're dead. So if you're spending 20 seconds of that, trying to get into your pack to find something to help yourself, which would be very difficult if you're solo and you do that. But if your partner does it, um, if there's two guys hunting and uh, you want to obviously <laughs> not die within 30 to 45 seconds, but you're spending half that time trying to find the medical kit. And you're really, really in trouble. Yeah. And, and that's uh, one of the, so I always kept like, you know, one of those little bags for my medical kit. Like I think the one I had was from Kafaru, but it's just a little, you said bunch of companies make them, but small little uh, kit. But I always kept it at the bottom of my pack next to my, um, my kill kit essentially it was the same color just different size down there and i was like all right that's not really helping the situation including myself to remember exactly where it was or i'm reaching down in there in the bottom trying to find it so i started carrying it either in my lid of my pack or um if i wasn't carrying a lid if it was just more of a day type hunt i would just just on the inside towards the top exactly what you were saying and clip it on so it's very easy to grab and and go but uh, I, I like the color idea because, like you said, all of I if I'd laid out all of my bags on the ground, they're all pretty similar earth tone type <laughs> colors. Uh, exactly, and that that makes it makes it difficult for right. someone that doesn't know, uh, you know, where it's at, or even yourself when you're in kind of a high stress situation. Well, I'm telling you, I mean, I you know that's part of my my daily routine is high stress situations, but I can tell you that on the mountain, a couple of, uh, issues that have happened. And, you know, even like as somebody who does it for a living, it, it's, it's still stressful and I don't want to have to think about it. I want to, I want to eliminate all the extra steps and I want to eliminate all the, the uncertainty when something bad happens. And I think that's not just for a surgeon who happens to be a hunter. I have, that's for all hunters. I think that the, the comfort level, I can't keep stressing this enough is that you, you just have to, if you want to save somebody's life, if you want it to react and, uh, and be helpful, let's just say not even life threatening, but if you want to be helpful, the stress, the panic situation has to be eliminated or else nobody's going to do well. Yeah. So, and the only way you get there is to know what you have, be comfortable with it and know how to use it. Yep. And I, it's what I like to hear is as this, you know, company starts gaining traction is that I'll get reports one or two a year <coughs> of, of uh, hunters that have used the kit and they'll send me pictures and say, Hey, look, I bust out your kit. I was able to keep hunting that day. I killed the one guy killed a moose uh, later in the trip. So it's, it's really neat. And that's really kind of what I've been after all along is it's, it's not my 401k. It never will be. It's, it's a lot of work and a lot of investment to, to do these things, these kits, but to, to make sure that the hunters have access to them and know how to use them is really my goal um, you know, in moving forward with this. And it's, it's been really, it's been a lot of fun. It's been really good. 
Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And so, what what if I, I'm kind of interested to hear some of your customer stories or maybe personal stories of situations l- like that where they've had to to right. use their kit. Do you have any that come I can, to mind? I can think of three. I you know, I, there's probably more, but I think of three big ones. And um, I actually, I know I posted them on Instagram, a couple of them on Instagram, and then I should probably put them on my website as well. I'm actually redoing the website. Um, this month and next month, it'll be a lot better. Um, a lot more interesting anyway. Uh, so <laughs> the first one I, I come to think of, uh, was 2019. It was, it was a spring hunt. It was grizzly in Northern Alaska out of Uniclete. And, uh, I killed a giant grizz and got out of, got out of Dodge, so to speak, and was on my way home and got home and back to work. And I get a text from, from Lance, uh, Kronberger, who's the outfitter. And he said, Hey, did you hear about Shane? And there's no privacy uh, violations or anything here. It's, it's, you know, I got permission from, from Shane to talk about it. Well, Shane was my guide and it turns out that his very next hunter, the very next hunt, they, he wounded a, a boar, a pretty big bear. And, uh, well, Shane went in after it. He's the guide. And uh, long story short, he, he's been doing this for you know 20 plus years. It's, he's no stranger to tracking a wounded grizzly. Well, this grizzly charged and attacked him. He came in absolutely silent. It's not like the Revenant, you know, where you know there's the screaming and you know it's a great movie, one of my favorites. Um, but came in completely silent, ears pinned back. There was no popping of the jaws, no growling, no snarling, and just came for him and attacked him and mauled him pretty bad. And so he so <laughs> he so happened to have. I gave him a medical kit it was part of his tip, and uh, but. A good learning, you know, a good learning experience here is that he had the medical kit in his backpack. He didn't tell the hunter that he had one. The hunter kind of had his crap together. He he hit you know SOS on the inReach. He got out the cell phone. He called nine one one. He got the state police, you know, Alaska State Troopers. Long story short, you know, he wasn't in shock or anything. He was obviously scared and everything, but he's a, he's a super tough dude, and he just you know they got. Uh, he, you know, extra jacket and covered him up and everything. And they, they had to go through the, it was, it was un, actually an unbelievable story. State troopers couldn't help him. Coast guard couldn't help him. They got rerouted to air force, our air force base there, I think in Fairbanks. Right. And they ended up sending, um, a, a transport plane with a chopper inside it landed and then, uh, scrambled the chopper and came up and dropped, uh, like a couple of, and dropped the ladder down and got them all out. It was, it's an amazing story. And, and yeah, but uh, uh, pertinent to our conversation is he had the kit, never opened it because it was literally the, the week after I was there. I didn't tell the hunter that he had the medical kit. Mm-hmm. And of course, I gave him grief about it. I said, "Dude, like you couldn't take a quick picture of you laying there all chewed up, holding my medical kit." And he thought, he thought it's pretty, I said, man, that would have been like the best advertisement ever. <laughs> so, so it, it's, it, it happens, man. So here's literally, you know, a guy that I gave a medical kit to that is mauled by a freaking grizzly the very next week. That's crazy. And, you know, and no life threatening injuries, but when you're getting chewed on by an 800 pound, eight and a half foot grizzly, then that's pretty serious business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Crazy. Well, he still carries his medical kit for sure. He's opened it now. Yeah, he's actually open. <laughs> but, you know, he's a, he's, these guys are tough, right? So they just think, well, if it happens to me, I'll be all right. And I think that's just, that's not the right attitude because it definitely changes perspective of, of uh, you know, after hunting so many, I forget how many grizzly kills he's been on, but it's, it's dozens and dozens. And, you know, he's been dodging the bullet for that many years and finally caught up to him. And he thinks he checked the box now, it won't happen again, but it's kind of like, flipping heads or tails, right? It doesn't matter if you get five or six heads in a row, the chances of it being a heads the next time is still the same. So, you know, just because he got attacked once doesn't mean he won't be attacked again. You know, it can happen again. You know, with, with, I say this when I say guys and males in particular, because we're usually more hard headed um, than females, but you know, ego and complacency can really come into bad mixture as a bad mixture. Yeah. And yeah, it's bad mixture. Yeah. As, and I, I just know this from, from my profession and, and doing things like that in manufacturing and, and understanding it, but being able to recognize that state and when you are that, um, you know, 
when your ego is getting in the way or when you are being complacent is important <laughs> to, right. to making sure that you are ready for these types of situations. And, uh, another one is, uh, I actually drew an Arizona elk tag for archery a couple years ago. It's so funny. It's the same year, again, the same season. And so I left, killed, killed a really good bull. And, um, the out, I gave the outfitter a kit, um, and, he texts me something about, Hey, what's this thing or whatever? Like, what's going on? He goes, well, we had a little incident and I'm like, well, what happened? And he sends me a picture of an elk tying through a guy's thigh. Yeah. And exactly what you think happened. They were, they were quartering the elk, um, the elk either moved or the hunter trip or the, um, the guide trip and fell on the antler and it went right through his inner thigh and came out the front of his thigh. So luckily it, you know, didn't rupt, didn't cut or, uh, injure the femoral artery or vein, but it's only because of luck, right? I mean, it, it, the your great vessels in your thigh and your groin are very, very stout. So even with penetrating trauma, um, they get pushed out of the way rather than like the tip of the antler going through the middle of the artery is very unlikely. That's kind of a, it's a sharp penetrating trauma, but it's also kind of dull. It's not a razor blade. It's not a Havilon. It's not a hunting knife. So, but it was actually a really cool picture. And uh, he was, he said that, you know, they, washed it out. They used some of the dressings that were in the medical kit and, uh, the guy was fine. He had to go to the hospital and had to go to surgery and get it washed out because it was a contaminated wound. Um, so, so we have elk antler, we have uh, grizzly bear and then, uh, last but not least, uh, a blade. So another customer client, um, he lives in Alaska and he was on a moose hunt and this was just last year, actually killed his moose. He had waders on, you know, they, you hunt moose in Alaska and waders a lot of the time. And, uh, they were quartering out this moose and, uh, he cut himself in the thigh through the waiter, which, you know, rubber waders pretty thick, but you know, he was trying to cut, I mean, moose are incredibly big, tough, strong animals and their soft tissues and muscles and tendons are, are what you would expect. And, uh, he was trying to forcibly cut through something and it slipped and he went right through his, his waiter leg. And he sent me all the pictures from the, immediately started taking pictures and his buddy, you know, dumped out his kit. His buddy knew where his kit was, the kit he bought for me. He has a picture of the kit laying there open, a picture of his leg and he rolled, you know, took his pants down. He had a pretty deep laceration in his thigh. And had he not had the waders on, I think that he, he could have gotten one of his femoral artery or vein. And then, then you got a big problem, obviously. Yeah. So he was very grateful to, to have the kit and to, he was familiar with it. He had, he was a very serious uh, outdoorsman. And he knew what was in it and he knew how to, you know, apply first aid and things like that. So, but if you're by yourself when something like that happens, again, the whole, uh, stress situation is probably elevated even further. So you just have to take a deep breath, know that you're not going to die unless, you know, it's obviously a life threatening injury or a femoral artery or something like that and just take care of business. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are, those are good stories that can go from the, the, the highest end type, you know, with a grizzly right. attack down to the simplest, you know, of cutting yourself with a knife that can happen, um, uh, probably more frequently than you, than you hear about in the, right. in those backcountry situations or really any, any type of, uh, situation when it comes to, uh, field dressing an animal, um, from that standpoint. I think that, but I think that has to be, most it'll be the most common. You asked about like the things to worry about and and you know, the the mountain hunting with uh, people who have never done it or maybe elderly or have some ma- medical history. You really you know the 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 cardiac events are big and you know all you can do is is what you can do until help gets there, whether it's CPR or or things like that. But um, the the lacerations, I think, for purposes of our conversation today, I think that's the the, the big thing. Just be careful. Use common sense. It seems to happen that we kill these things right at dark yep. with headlamps on, and um, people are trying to help. You know, you got guys holding the leg up, and you're trying to disarticulate the, the, f- the front quarters and the rear quarters, and get them popped out of joint. And it's just, it's I've seen it happen in, in my hunts, and I and I hear stories, and I see the pictures, and the customers you know sending me. It's just so slow down, be careful, and then I mean, I I always have my kit laying there whenever I get we get an animal. And we're we're um, caping it or we're quartering it or whatever. I always have medical kit laying out. Yeah, it's just it's just a reflex that I've been doing for you know ten fifteen years now because 
if it's one of those really bad ones, you, like I said, you have 30 to 45 seconds to, to treat or else it's over. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, one, one question I have, it's a little bit, uh, situ- situational depending on where you are, uh, geographically, but what about, have you had any experience or have anything for your kids that have to do with venomous snakes or dealing with yeah. those? Yeah, actually, uh, that's an option on, um, on one of my kit models. Um, it's not something you would carry in a high country, right? So the yeah. likelihood of seeing a, a venomous snake on pie is pretty low, but where you hunt deer, um, I think it's, it's possible. And then a lot of your listeners probably, uh, live and hunt in the American Southwest or, um, even the deep South. I mean, there's venomous snakes throughout, I mean, there's a large distribution in our country. Um, that Arizona hunt that I talked about, uh, you know, up in the mountains where it, 9,000 feet, but, you know, we're driving around the lower elevations and there's rattlesnakes on the road. So, yeah, I mean, obviously the Western diamondback was very real in that part of Arizona. Um, so we all know about the snake bite kits and I have those in, uh, one of the options on the, the midsize kit that I sell. Um, I think if you're in an area where, you know, there's venomous snakes, then you should probably have one. Now we, we know about the plunger and you put it on there and it's supposed to suck the venom out and things like that. So, I think it it behooves us to to talk about like you don't don't cut it you know there, there's no reason to, to lacerate the area where the snake bite is try to squeeze out the poison even though that's kind of a running joke but I think people still think you're supposed to do that and you're not just leave the wound alone um, you can clean it with the alcohol swab or betadine swab if you want but I think the uh, the elevation is important and obviously seeking medical help you're not going to carry anti venom nobody's going to carry that. The snake bite kit can be helpful as far as um, if it's applied early with that that suction device. But there's a type of tourniquet that I put. If somebody's interested in the snake bite kit, then the type of tourniquet I put in that medical kit is the rubber bandage type. It's called a SWAT tourniquet. And the reason why I put that in with somebody who's going to be in snake country is you can use that to, I don't want to say exsanguinate the limb, it's the op- opposite. It's actually applying it above where the snake bite is and wrapping it circumferentially, this rubber bandage down towards the bite site itself. What that does, it pushes the venom out of the, the system, out of the limb, down closer to where the snake bit you. And then you apply the tourniquet. You, you use that wrap that is a tourniquet, and then you tie it off above the snake bite. So what that does, any venom that got into the limb over 30, 45, 60 seconds before you get your kit out, um, you can help push it back down the limb so it doesn't go up into your, your central system right mm-hmm. so that i would i would absolutely carry in snake countries that type of tourniquet and instead of the combat apply tourniquet or the other there's a myriad of t- tourniquets on the market but that that rubber bandage one if you were serious about snake bites and worried about them that's the type i would carry and that's the treatment i would render um people always it's interesting that uh, that's a good point now we're talking about tourniquets the pendulum has shifted even in my you know, 20 years of medical practice uh, as far as application of tourniquets in traumatic situation. It went from, don't you dare, unless you're a medical professional, you don't know what you're doing and nobody should ever apply it. And then along comes Afghanistan and Iraq where, you know, soldiers and Marines were coming in with literally two, three, four tourniquets on them. And because their medics or their, um, their buddies were, if they saw that a limb was bleeding, they would apply a tourniquet. And that wasn't the wrong thing to do because they're limiting blood loss even from slow bleeders, not just arterial pumpers. Obviously, if you see an artery pumping blood, then you got to put a tourniquet above it. Um, so I think that when they're applied correctly, which isn't that hard to do, and I mean, I use a tourniquet in the OR two hours at a time. And so you're not going to leave it on for 18 hours, but if you apply it and it's on for a couple hours, even a little bit longer, the risk of damage to the tissues is, is nil. Mm-hmm. So I think the risk of blood loss is higher than uh, the risk of application of a tourniquet. So the pendulum has swung. Now they're saying, well, hell yeah, put a tourniquet on. If it's, I call it audible bleeding. If it's audible bleeding, meaning it's pouring, yeah, then apply a tourniquet. If it's just a little nick and you have a little bit of dribble of a blood, do you need a tourniquet? You got to use common sense, right? You don't have to be a surgeon to know that. If, if it's a lot of blood, like coming out, if it's a, a blast wound or an open fracture or, you know, laceration from, from skinning or quartering, um, then I don't think it hurts to apply the tourniquet, but keep in mind, you know, two hours, two and a half hours, hopefully you'll be reassessed by a medical professional by then. Yeah, no, I think that's, 
I think that's very important. I'm glad you, you went into that from just the tourniquet standpoint and the, the venomous snake bites. I mean, yeah, like where I deer hunt and turkey hunt and just even scouting in the summertime, like there's, there's a decent amount of rattlesnakes yeah, that, exactly. that I'll come across or sometimes you don't see them when the ferns are high and all these other things. And, and, yeah. and then also I, um, you know, even where I was hunting in, uh, Idaho, uh, some of the lower elevations at the yeah. base, there was, there was a rattlesnake that crossed the road and stuff and, and more of that kind of open country type, almost high desert type country, um, that you'd find even in the Southwest and, and, and different places there. I just think that's, that's something that I don't hear much of any talk about and i think it's important and i've all you know thought about it and i've brought it up in my some of my personal first aid cpr classes that i've taken and you know asked yeah. these questions about it and uh it was kind of interesting that even in some of the ones i went to that they didn't really have a whole lot of answers no me. it's a very uh, rare right but yeah it doesn't happen but it does happen like i treated one in my career one snake bite in my career and um you know it's not pretty so it, Number one is prevention. Obviously, I think everybody would agree to that. Just be careful. Know where you're putting your hand. Most of the bites occur on the hand, mm -hmm. right? Um, second would be lower extremity, but you know we usually have thick pants on and higher boots. So, but the hand and the forearm is, is number one. That's where you're going to get the snake bite. And uh, so, just be careful where you're putting your hand. If you're in snake country, um, leaning back and sitting on a log, and then putting your hand back you know, to rest and things like that. that's usually where you'll get hit. But again, back to the whole panic thing, like that's, if anything's going to have somebody panic, it's going to be a freaking snake bite, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people are going to lose their shit if they get bitten by a snake. So again, keep them calm, keep yourself calm if it's you and then just take care of business. Don't just sit there saying, oh my God, oh my God, like, what am I going to do? Well, you know, again, have a plan, calm down and, and activate the plan and put the, get that, that rubber tourniquet I talked about, that SWAT, you know, apply it above push the venom back down towards the snake bite and then tie it off. Okay. It was, there was something you were saying about, um, elevating it. Right. So explain that. Yeah, so bit. I would, yeah, I would elevate, just elevate the limb, obviously. Uh, well, what about the venom? It's going to pour down towards the heart. Well, that's really not, it's, it's irrelevant. That's if you have the tourniquet on above the snake bite, after you pushed all the venom down that you can with that rubber tourniquet and, uh, keeping the patient calm, you know, the cardiovascular output, right? If his heart rate's 150, and I mean, now, now you're just returning more venom to the, the, the heart, right? So um, you worry about just keeping the patient calm because of the cardiovascular implications of the, the, the venom and things like that. And then getting that tourniquet above the snake bite, keeping it elevated uh, just for the swelling. Compartment syndrome is a very real thing. So the swelling gets out of hand, and then we have a problem called compartment syndrome, which it's a true surgical emergency. You can lose you know, limb over something like that. So, and obviously medevac, get the, get the person out, get them to the hospital as soon as possible. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, so I think we covered uh, a lot of stuff here on this podcast, Brian, is there anything else that you think that maybe I didn't ask you or we glossed over that you wanted to kind of drive home here? No, I think that uh, we talked a lot and it was some good, some really good stuff. I think the take home points for your listeners would be is get a medical kit. Number one, number two, learn how to use it, know what's in it. And if you don't get help, ask somebody. And, um, and number three, just stay calm when there is an emergency, not just a little cut on your finger or a little uh, bruise on your elbow. But if it's a true emergency, you got to stay calm and everybody in the party has to stay calm. And then, um, I think you touched on it early on, but when you do travel for your hunting or any other adventures that you do, um, make sure people know that where you're going, who you're with, what the plan is. Like you said, you know where the nearest hospital is and things like that. I think that's a great idea. And uh, now I, I'm pretty sure that 90, I'd say almost 90% or more of people that do the backcountry hunting, they have an emergency beacon, whether it's a the spot is the old one, but like the, the in reach or, you know, sat phones are trying to, you know, they're still popular, but I think the in reach devices are even more popular. So have something like an emergency beacon. Yeah. If you're going to be by yourself, especially, but even with a, a hunting partner or one of you has to have it. And if you separate having one of one medical kit or one in reach, and you guys are hunting different basins or different, like it doesn't do you any good. Right. So, yeah, definitely. Like, you're not going to text your buddy and say, Hey, you know, I cut myself really bad. Come find me. I'm, I'm bleeding out. I'm getting faint. <laughs> that's not, 
going to happen. So make sure if you do separate while you're hunting, make sure you have, yeah, uh, one of each, make sure you each have emergency, um, supplies, whether a medical kit and then the beacon, of course. Yeah. Very, very good points. Um, where, where can people find, um, some more information, uh, Brian on your, your medical kits, if someone's interested in checking those out? Yeah, it's, uh, so the, the company is Safari Medic and Mountain Medic, but the, the easier website, they all land the same place. Safari Medic dot com will take you to my website which is being overhauled as we speak so there you can see just the background um, of the company where where i came from and why i started it you know obviously uh the different types of kits that are there and again like i said it's it's getting redone as we speak and it's going to be a lot better it's going to we're really going to hit home the the uh personalized concierge medicine part of it if you're going on these big hunts and, and you're interested in um being a you know having the medications and things like that and having the professional medical advice and you can sign up for that and you, it's as easy as filling out an online uh, health questionnaire it's kind of like during covid when your doctors are doing the uh telemedicine it's yep. going to be very similar to that so i'm going to start developing that a bit more than just building medical kits that's uh you know, that's where that's the foundation of the company is just providing the professional grade medical kits for hunters and outdoorsmen but i really want to develop the the concierge type uh, medicine for the guy that's you know going on a once in a lifetime trip to Africa or or Alaska on a moose hunt or Mexico or things like that, um, where you may need prescription medications and medical care uh, prior to. So safarimedic.com and uh, yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this. I think it was a good conversation and uh, hopefully it'll help people out and get them thinking a little bit more in the forefront rather than a uh, uh, afterthought. That's right. But I really appreciate it. And uh, remember, hope is not a plan, right? Yep, exactly. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.